Six months ago, on February 25th, Valve officially launched the Steam Deck. It was quite an important day in history of both PC gaming and gaming on Linux. This handheld gaming PC got a pretty warm reception, though some people were slightly disappointed by its battery life, slow and buggy UI, minor compatibility issues and quite a noisy fan. And so I thought it would be nice to talk about how Valve addressed those issues, what they did in the past six months to improve user experience, how big libraries nowadays did they manage to make a battery last longer, and so on. I'm not going to waste your time talking about the design and the specs of this tiny little beast, but instead, I want to share my own experience and how it changed after 3.2 and 3.3 updates. Please keep in mind that I'm a PC gamer myself, I've got a huge library of Steam games, so I'm kind of emotionally invested in the Valve's ecosystem, and also I'm a Linux enthusiast, so it's fair to say that I'm a little bit biased. Also, please be aware that when you see a high-resolution gameplay footage like this on full screen, you should know that it was recorded on my home desktop PC and not on the Steam Deck. That's because Steam Deck's display has weird 16x10 aspect ratio and it kinda contradicts with my intention to keep the image in my videos consistent and aesthetically pleasing. I have no intention to fool you or to give you false expectations and I hope that I made it clear. So yeah, let's start with the library. Over the past six months, Steam Deck's library became like four times bigger than it was in February, and now the number of verified and playable titles is getting closer to five thousands. That is indeed an astonishing achievement. However, it may not be obvious for you how this comically huge number of games translates into your potential gaming experience. The thing is, almost 30% of the top 100 most popular games on Steam right now listed as unsupported, mostly due to the lack of anti-cheat support, and quite a lot of retro titles, especially those that requires you to manually install an unofficial community patch, also are not available on Steam Deck yet. So if you have a long list of competitive online games on your account, or maybe some really nice relics of the past, your Steam library may not intersect with a list of verified titles. So it really depends on you and your personal preference. In my case, two days before the launch on February 23, only 21% of my entire library was marked as verified or at least playable. Nowadays it is 69%. That's impressive, especially when you realize that like two-thirds of those games were never meant to be played on Linux, and about 10% were released without a proper controller support, only mouse and keyboard. And still, here I am, playing them on the Steam Deck running Linux. Again, to me, that's impressive. But there's a rub. Steam compatibility reviews are not 100% accurate. They can give you a vague expectation of what you will get, but you should know that I've encountered maybe a few dozens of games that were listed as untested or even unsupported, while in reality were totally playable. But there are also a few examples of the opposite case, when games with a green checkmark or yellow exclamation point do not work so well, or in-game text is barely readable, or the game doesn't use appropriate controller icons and on-screen keyboard doesn't pop in up automatically when it's needed. Of course, none of those games were completely broken, but the problem is you never know how a certain game will work until you give it a try. And if you want to buy a modern game that is actively supported specifically to play it on the Steam Deck, you should keep in mind that a single unfortunate update can cause performance issues and even make the game unplayable for an uncertain amount of time. The fact that Steam Deck is capable of running modern AAA games is indeed mind-blowing, at least for some people. But in my experience, I didn't spend that much time playing them on my Steam Deck. When it comes to AAA titles with insane level of details with high fidelity graphics, a handheld device with a 7-inch display doesn't feel right to me. 
I would still prefer to play those games on my home PC in front of the big display. I want to be immersed in those games, I want to be steeped in their vast open worlds, I want to be marinated in sound design and I want to enjoy every single moment. And not to be bothered with battery life, thermals and simply without compromising any performance. Which you have to do if you want to squeeze out at least one and a half or maybe two hours of battery life out of your Steam Deck. Yes, Valve did their best to give us tools to find the perfect balance between the battery life and the performance. And I'm going to talk about them in a minute, but still, graphically demanding games consume too much power to play them on a go. The same applies to fast-paced action games and especially first-person shooters. Despite that some of them runs battery smooth at 60 frames per second, it is extremely painful to aim while looking at this tiny 7-inch display. Well, technically you can't do the aiming, thanks to aim assist, but it doesn't feel as rewarding as landing a perfect shot with your own mouse. But, you know, even if I'm not going to play Apex Legends on the Steam Deck, still I was super excited to see it being verified because it means that I will be able to enjoy it on my home desktop PC running Linux. And the same applies to all AAA titles that are now became playable on Linux. Considering that none of those games was developed with intention to be launched and played on completely different OS, that is a miracle. All major titles released on PC this year, like God of War, Elden Ring, Stray and Spider-Man, they all were available on Linux since day one. I am genuinely amazed by the fact that Valve spent so much resources to significantly change the landscape of gaming on Linux. And it's surprisingly satisfying to watch how Steam Deck's library gets bigger with every new release of Proton compatibility layer. As I mentioned before, Valve did their best to help us find the right balance between performance and battery life. Initially, they gave us tools to reduce power usage either by limiting TDP or frame rate, and then later they introduced the slider that allows you to adjust the screen refresh rate on the fly and save per game performance profile. Limiting your frame rate is not a perfect solution, since less frames will result in increased input delay, so it's definitely not going to work in every case. But there are a lot of RPGs, turn-based strategies and visual novels that will benefit from it. The cool thing about role-playing games like Disco Elysium is that it can push frame limit even further. It's a text-based RPG, there are no fast-paced action sequences, so you can sacrifice a lot of frames and help the battery last longer. And also turn your Steam Deck into quite exquisite ebook. Sadly, switching from 60fps to 40 in graphically demanding games will help you squeeze out only about extra 30 minutes of battery life. So, if you want to play for 5 or 6 hours uninterrupted, you should avoid modern AAA titles and stick to indie games. Roguelikes, platformers, turn-based strategies, story-driven role-playing games and etc. One of the reasons why battery life is so important is because it is a key to portability. We already know that Steam Deck is a great handheld PC, but is it portable? Well, not quite if you bought it to play games with insane graphics, but also the portability of the Steam Deck is undermined by publishers who use aggressive DRM and endorse anti-consumer practices. Technically, it's not a Valve's fault, Steam itself has a pretty good implementation of an offline mode, but you should keep in mind that it's almost impossible to launch a game from like Rockstar Game Launcher or Ubisoft Connect while being offline. Some games like Hitman 3 requires you to be online to play the game. Without a Wi-Fi, you will lose your access to all escalation contracts, sniper missions and other downloadable content. You may use your smartphone to create a Wi-Fi hotspot, but my point is that portability of the Steam Deck is flawed by publishers who are busy turning every game into a service, making it unplayable until the server side of the game will verify payments for each installed DLC. That is ridiculous. 
Another problem that is related to the Steam Deck is the way how Steam Dynamics Sync currently works. You've probably heard about it. If it's enabled, any changes appearing in the Steam Cloud can be downloaded to the one machine while the game is running on the other one. So right before your Steam Deck goes into sleep mode, Steam Dynamics Sync should automatically upload all modified save files to the cloud, allowing you to flawlessly resume the game on your main PC. Which is great, but it seems that there is is no consensus among devs on how to use this feature. The problem is, quite a lot of games upload config files along with your save game data, so instead of having a seamless, uninterrupted transition, you get the opposite, because now all settings from your Steam Deck will be downloaded and applied to the main PC. And instead of quick resume, you have to go to the settings and dial back the resolution, graphics and everything else to have the best experience on your local machine. And then later you pick up the Steam Deck and then goes back to your home PC and you have to change settings again and again and again. That is annoying to say the least and I hope that Valve will rule this out, either by releasing strict guidelines on which data should be uploaded to the cloud, or maybe it's devs who should keep up to three config files for different machines, like main PC, laptop and the Steam Deck. The 3.2 update also brought us the new fan curve, which basically made the fan more responsive and less noticeable, especially while playing indie games. I did my best to record it during both high and low use case scenarios, and this is how it sounds. I've boosted the audio in post just a little to make the sound more pronounced, so to speak, and I kinda like it. It's not too loud, the pitch is ok, and it's crazy to see how much problems Valve were able to resolve simply by releasing a software update. Don't get me wrong, SteamOS is far from perfect, you can find a lot of small, bite-sized bugs here and there, and even now, in August, navigating through library pages feels extremely unresponsive. But there is nothing I would call a deal-breaker. I want to highlight that value of the Steam Deck has been significantly increased over the past six months. Even back then, in February, it already was like an impressive handheld PC that allows you to play a thousand games on a go, and yet they managed to make it even better. Thank you, Valve, from the bottom of my heart for transforming the landscape of gaming on Linux forever. This was Reluctant Anarchist, and I have nothing left to say.